I bought a Miller Synchrowave 250 back in the early 90s to start my welding side hustle in a garage. I bought the welder because a small company told me if I had a welder I could weld their parts and I knew I could pay for the welder that way, but what worked best for me is working with small mom and pop machine shops who didn't have their own full-time welder. Some of the welding was done in my garage, some of it was done at their location in their shops. It's a really good variety, lots of different metal types, lots of different processes. When you're in business for yourself, you learn things that you wouldn't otherwise learn. I learned a lot from each job that came along, and I'm going to try to bring that out of each job that I show you today. Let's do it. One of the first jobs that came along was this sewer crawler. It's a remote control tractor with a camera on top to inspect sewers. It started off as a piece of square tubing, and it's just got stuff welded on it. I'd weld a little bit. I'd give it back to the machinist. He'd line bore some things. He'd machine off a, a mating surface. I'd weld some more, give it back to him. It was some MIG and some TIG. It also had some free machining steels on it, some free machining 303 stainless welded to carbon steel like these shafts right here. You have to really be careful on free machining stainless. First of all, it's not recommended for welding, but it's very easy to undercut it. It's very easy to crack, but it worked good for this application. It was a low stress application. There were also some 12L14 bungs or bosses, I should say. That will also crack if you're not careful. It's just a special technique like not getting the arc too close to the base metal. That's why I use a lay wire technique like this. But that's how I got the job was somebody else had just really cobbled these welds up and they needed to take the part to a trade show and they were in a jam. And so by getting them out of a jam, I got pretty much all their work from there on out. I lost count on how many of these parts that I welded, but it had to be way over 100. I didn't get rich off of it, but it did allow me to take a vacation here and there. For general fabrication, sometimes short circuit MIG is fine, but anything that might be used for a lifting device or something like that, it's best to use some other process other than short circuit MIG. I used pulse spray MIG for this job right here just for that reason. If you read any of the welding codes, especially AWS welding codes, short circuit MIG is really discouraged for anything structural. Stick welding, pulse spray MIG, dual shield flux core are all much better choices for anything that might be used as a lifting device. Modular fixturing and welding tables with indexed holes are worth their weight in gold when you have to do a lot of fabrication and stuff that's repetitive. You can set it up one time and you can fit stuff up and you can knock the parts out. If you've never used modular fixturing, like stronghand tool stuff, it's hard to really, it's hard to really visualize just how beneficial it is. It's not until after you start using it till you start having those ideas, you start getting more creative, you start getting more efficient, you start having lots of ideas, it opens up your mind. This particular rack was a fun job and it was actually a rack for transporting aircraft fan blades. When you're in business for yourself, eventually you're going to get some round parts, but when is it worth it to buy a turntable? You never know if that second order is ever going to come in. So my first order of round parts, I fabricated this crude turntable out of a 10-speed bicycle. It was powered by a quarter-inch drill motor that I got at a yard sale for $5. I used a quarter-inch mandrel up against the rubber part of the tire so I wouldn't transfer current through the drill motor. I made a really crude torch holder, but it was adjustable, and it worked, and it just had a heavy weight on the bottom to hold it still. And I could run the speed of the part just about right to where I could weld one part while I was wire brushing the part I just welded. A homemade tail stock with a piece of quarter inch stainless tubing inserted into the part gave me an argon purge. I was good to go. Then I got a promise of doing hundreds more of those parts, so I bought a welding lathe off eBay and those parts dried up. Hardly ever got another one. But I never regretted buying that welding lathe because I used it on so many other jobs. It paid for itself in no time. Now, I call this a welding lathe because it had a tail stock on it, but more often than not, I really didn't need the tail stock. I could have just used a positioner turntable. 
But there were several jobs where it did come in handy having the torch holder and it had an actuator on it that was air powered. So I could just do that, get it up out of the way, release the tailstock, change parts. I mentioned earlier sometimes you get drawings, sometimes you don't. Uh, occasionally you get really good drawings. It pays to be able to read them. Working for small machine shops, there were quite a few jobs where I do a little welding and then I'd pass it back to the machine shop. They'd do some machining and then give it back to me, maybe for final steps, final welding. I actually kind of enjoyed that because since this was a side hustle for me, I kind of enjoyed the break. Now this is that same part. I did quite a few of these. I decided instead of using the stationary torch holder that I would get the tail stock out of the way and just weld them by hand and kind of get some more practice walking the cup get used to that again. The other end of this part was slightly different, a little beveled uh, insert, and instead of having a prop mechanism, I just decided to rest that TIG Finger XL right next to the weld, and I had the machine set up at about two pulses a second, and that provided a nice steady prop. My fingers didn't get hot, came out pretty good. There were a handful of jobs where being able to silver braze really came in handy and this is one of them, silver brazing a copper washer onto a stainless bolt. But having some silver wire along with some flux in your toolbox uh, gets you out of a pinch sometimes. You never know what kind of job is going to come in. And sometimes you do a job just as a favor to keep a customer happy. Like this one here, a broken stud in an exhaust manifold. Knowing how to get one of these out is helpful. In this case, I'm just using some Hastelloyd W, but 309 or 312 wire would work pretty well. I'm in no hurry to build that up because I want to soak a lot of heat into that stud. And once I get heat soaked in there, I build a, a nice little pumpkin ball on there, then put a bolt on top of that, and then squirt a little WD all around it. I've heard candle wax actually works really good because of the flash point, but this one came out with the WD. I did a few aluminum MIG jobs along the way. The first big one I did was this big fixture. Kind of had to do a little layout work on the table, get things centered up. About a 200 degree preheat sure does help on thick aluminum like this. For this job, I just used a, a Hobart Iron Man with a spool gun. But along the way, I got hold of a push-pull setup, and man, it was nice. This, this job had a lot of different parts that went to it. It was some type of a stand. And I really didn't have to do much preheating on this because I was able to weld certain areas first and kind of like build the heat up in the part. I remember the most important things on this job were distortion. So I had to clamp, clamp it down to the table, had to clamp the base plates to themselves and, and kind of weld them back to back so that each base plate was pulling against itself and then when I cut them loose it was fairly flat. This little assembly here is kind of tricky because that pin has to slide in and out freely once it's all welded up. Getting it tacked up with those little L brackets coming off the table that was easy to get it square and then putting a lot of weld on the very ends first that made it pull a lot less. So I did I welded the outside first with the pin still in it to keep it from moving and then I welded the inside keeping the pin in it as much as I could I think the main thing that helped was getting a lot of weld on the ends before I ever started welding the inside and outside let's fast forward through the rest of it because it's quite the job I want you to be able to see the end product but without showing this this doesn't make as much sense so the end product powder coated and everything looked like this again it was a stand for some kind of aircraft engine part one super important thing is communicating with the customer. In this case, these parts got a black oxide treatment. And I would not have known that had I not have asked. Socket inserts like this are often made out of chrome vanadium steel. And typically I'd go with a 309 filler on something like that. But knowing that it was going to get black oxide treatment, I went with the ER70. I also found out by talking with the customer that these parts would also get a black oxide treatment. This job had a fairly detailed set of drawings with it, with weld symbols. This was a lifting device, and so it kind of gave me a little bit of pause because they specified welding on that forged lifting ring there. 
and that's usually not a good idea. But I learned this part was only going to be lifting about 50 pounds. Again, communication with the customer is key. A very similar job, this was a load balancer type lifting device. Came with a pretty detailed set of drawings, but a pretty simple job. Really a fun job. Sometimes you get jobs like that that you wish you had a thousand of. Gravy. It'd be nice if you could cherry pick your jobs, but you can't. The machinist made me a fixture to tack these up and locate them. And it just was so easy to drop them down inside the hole of my turntable here. This job could be easily done without a turntable, but when you got a turntable, you want to use it. And even though it was only welding halfway around the part, it just made them go so quickly. And it was fun. A really common task is missed machine parts, misdrilled holes, things like that. Just something like, oh, I put the chamfer on the wrong side, or I put two chamfers instead of one. And so just building that back up, because they've got time in this part, it makes sense just to run a little bead, put back a little metal that got removed accidentally, and then they can remachine and go on about their business and save the part. Sometimes it's worth it for them to just make a new part. Other times they ran out of metal and it's the weekend and they need delivered the part on Monday. And so being able to replace metal like this is a benefit. Happens on all types of metal. This is a stainless piece right here. Something went wrong. That groove isn't supposed to be there. But they had a lot of time invested in the part. So just being able to put back that metal in, in some kind of reasonable fashion was very helpful. Knowing a little something about the properties of stainless helps when you're working for machine shops. You don't want to get it too hot for too long. And knowing that this thing's going to be turned down on a lathe, I wanted to make sure and put plenty of metal on there so I wouldn't have to come back and do the whole thing over again and touch up spots. Working with machinists, you, you kind of get a feel for how much metal you need to put on when something needs to clean up. Another really common job is just misdrilled holes. If you weld stainless steel without any kind of backup or argon gas, you're going to get sugaring on the backside. So a big aluminum block like this traps the argon. Makes a lot of sense to use this instead of argon, in fact, because you don't really have to have argon backup when you've got aluminum backup trapping the argon. It just depends on the application. Sometimes argon is required. Oftentimes aluminum backing is good enough. My experience working with small machine shops is a lot of carbon steel, some 4140, a lot of stainless, some aluminum. That'll change depending on what industry is in the area, what kind of work the machine shop does. This is replacing some journals in some roller shafts, some stainless steel roller shafts. My job was to put enough weld metal on there so that a nice radius could be machined back in there. Just like that. For plain carbon steel, cold rolled steel, you almost never need a preheat. This is 4140, a big thick chunk of 4140. Even though much of the strength that's required in this part is in the design, it's 4140 and 4140 will crack, it will harden, it will be brittle if you don't give it a good preheat. I welded this small weld first before then rechecking it and then welding the other side, maintaining a 500 degree preheat. The strength of this part is basically in the design because the load is sideways and it's welded on both sides. So I opted to use plain old ER70S2 filler wire because it's much less crack sensitive. Doing jobs in my own garage, sometimes I use my own oven to preheat parts. This is a big heavy chunk of 4130. Heated up to 550, then took it out to the garage, reheated it a little bit with a torch to make sure to get it up to temp. This is a two-pass weld, and this is the second pass you're looking at here. Again, some communication with my customer let me know that this was just an alignment fixture. No real strength required. 4130 was specified for dimensional tolerance and stability, more so than strength or hardness. So I used ER70S2 wire on this, too. I think we can see communication with the customer is an underlying trend here. Sometimes your job is to straighten something. In this case, there was a worn area on this shaft right here. I had to do some weld buildup as well as some heat placement, some cooling off with an air nozzle and a dial indicator to get it close enough to then remachine. 
using heat to straighten something is a, a skill all in itself and maybe that's a topic for a future video. Some jobs that come along are just really really simple. Modification of a wrench or a specialty tool. Nothing to it but you do need to do a good job and you do need to know how to select a filler metal. Again this is this is a off-the-shelf socket so I'm using Hastelloy W here as a filler metal. I know not everybody has Hastelloy W on the shelf but I just happened to get lucky and get a bunch of it at one time years ago. 309 filler would work just as well. The thing I liked working with machinists is that oftentimes they would build a fixture for me and it made it really easy. The thing you have to realize though is when somebody builds a fixture for you you got to be able to get the part off the fixture when you're finished welding it and weld metal shrinks. So again communicating with your machine shop or your customer if they're building the fixture make sure they build it in such a way so that you have some little areas to get a little pry bar in there maybe a little ported access to get a screwdriver and pry the part off the fixture when you're done makes a big difference. Communication is the key. Some parts fit just like they're supposed to, have just the right amount of gap or no gap to facilitate welding. Usually no gap is better, but in this case, actually having a little gap and be able to sink that arc in there kind of was beneficial. Other times maybe a part is cut just a little bit too short and being able to know how to build it up is important. Using some copper backing when you're doing build up beads saves a lot of time. Collecting chunks of copper like this and chunks of aluminum and chunks of stainless all for backing on different materials. I got several of them in my toolbox and they do save me a lot of time on things like this. I know that aluminum is not going to stick to copper so I can clamp that copper backing right there, weld that first bead and then stack beads on top of that bead and before you know it I've replaced a bunch of metal that got mismachined or whatever and now the part fits. You're going to have to select your own filler metal sometimes. Sometimes it'll be on the drawing. Most of the time it's up to you. In this particular case, this is some specialty wrenches made out of 4140 and welded to a standard socket ratchet head. Oftentimes those are made out of chrome vanadium steel, some type of hardenable steel. It's not going to be mild steel. So in this case, 309 would be a good choice. I used Hasteloid W just again because I have plenty of it around. It's really expensive. It's really pretty great. Knowing a little something about filler metal selection gets you out of a jam. Here's a whole bin of parts. It's all 303 free machining stainless steel. Well, they don't make 303 rod. What's the best rod for 303 stainless steel? There's a couple of choices. I have used Hasteloid W. But I learned that plain old 308L stainless steel works about the, as good as anything as long as you use the right kind of principles. So you don't want to go too hot. You want to make sure to put enough filler. You want to taper off your amperage slowly. You want to taper it off in a thick area where you don't leave a crater crack. To summarize, you need to know something about metals and how to weld them. You need to know when to preheat and how much to preheat. You need to know something about filler metal selection and you definitely need to communicate with the customer if you're going to be successful with your own side hustle welding business. Hey, I hope this helps. We'll see you next time.